Hi, I'm Paul Sherratt. I'm Martin Brennan. I'm Lewis Ward. <laughs> and welcome to the Gold Giving Podcast. So, Lewis Ward, welcome. Thank uh, you. For those of you that are watching, um, we're at Reading. I think you might be familiar with this place. Yeah, 13 years I spent here from 8 to 21. Had a season ticket until I was 16. It's my hometown club, so yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with this. Well, it's not the select car leasing stadium as I know it. What was it? The Medeski Stadium. Okay. <laughs> so you still <laughs> refer to it as that? Yeah, it's the Medeski Stadium. Mum and Dad living down the road? Yes, Mum and Dad live down the road. Popping for a cup of tea this morning or uh, before you came here? Might be lunchtime, might okay. be after, after this. Bit of a lunch. Yeah, we can't stretch, the budget doesn't stretch to sandwiches, does it? No, no. Or hot dogs in the cinema. Yeah, absolutely. On them last week. So, I thought it'd be really great. Obviously, you're at Swindon Town now, you're 25. Um, where did it all begin? How did, how did you end up where you're at? Take me back. Yeah, that's... Well, the first... Obviously, playing Saturday League around the local area with my, my local team. And the strange, strangest thing is, I mean, we, we, you know Sal, and I was playing cricket against the local school um, for my, my school. And I was going down to trial for Southampton afterwards. And Sal was the PE teacher of the, the opposing school. And he said, why are you going down to Southampton for? Come down for a trial at Reading. And that was it. Spent couple of weeks trialling and then next thing you know I'm signed and <laughs> to a school you were multi-sport talented was football your passion were you I wouldn't say multi-talented <laughs> okay um, well I know I just say multi-sport yeah, talented I so was capable of other sports okay um, football was obviously the one I was best at I mean I was always the goalkeeper there was no doubt about that I was in goal regardless um, don't know whether it was ability with feet not good enough or wasn't able to move or run, but I was in goal. Um, Were you tall at a young age? I was always tallest in the class, right. tallest in the team. Put so the big fella between the sticks. I think so, yeah. Okay. He can't get lobbed if he's head in the crossbar. Um, I think that was kind of the case when I was younger. Um, but yeah, I think, and then, as I said, chances be playing against Reading Academy goalie coach, senior goalie coach at the time, and he said, come down for a trial, so... That's how it happened. And how old were you then? Eight, I think. Wow. Yeah, I think it was eight. Um, and then spent all the years through the academy there and did my scholarship and had a few senior years as a pro. And what's that like? As a, we, we've, uh, we've, we're going to release another podcast um, about the role of a, of a dad mm. and kid and so on. From a kid's perspective, you're at, you're at, at eight... Were you dreaming of becoming a professional footballer or was it, you know what, this is great, Reading's down the road, the football club's good, I like my football, let's go and enjoy it. Where, where was your head I, at? I think it was both. I think at that age you don't think too far ahead. I mean, if you get my dad in for the podcast, he might think differently, but at that age you're just thinking about playing football and enjoying it. And um, Yeah, I think being back here it brings back a lot of memories. I spent a lot of time in the Dome, probably three or four nights a week, every week for... 40 weeks of the year probably and yeah it, it brings back a lot of memories that about the time that I spent there and the commitment it takes a toll on your family I mean I owe a lot to my parents for coming out of work early taking me to training sitting around in the cold sitting around in the heat because it's hotter in the dome <laughs> than it is outside um, but even even my brother coming along he gets dragged along and people don't experience that because my dad's working late my mum has to bring him from school as well. So people don't understand that it does take a toll on everybody, not just the person that's trying to make it. Massive commitment, definitely, from, from, from parents. Yeah, I think, I think if you have that backing, it makes it easier. I know a lot of people might not have been in the same lucky position as yeah. me to have a, a whole family at the time being able to do that, and it might have taken a toll on a few other boys that don't have the luxury of two parents that are able to help out at the time. So, yeah, I, I'm very privileged in the way I was able to be taken to training. So we're in a pro club environment. We're enjoying it. Football's good. Start to guess, I get 16, 17, starts to get a bit more serious, I guess, start to be offered <sighs> contracts. How does, how does that play out? Oh, I think it was tougher coming through. I think every year you get... I was never the one that got offered the two years. 
you got the boys in the team that are the best boys, the outfield players, you think, yeah, we'll give them two years, they're the best players in the team, they're scoring goals each week, they're yeah. doing this. I was always a late developer um, and I had a lot of backing from coaches more senior than the ones that were taking the age groups. Mm. Um, it was more of a case of he's growing, let him fully develop, there's potential there, let's wait and see. Um, because I was gangly, I couldn't move. Um, I was growing on average, I think it was like a centimetre and a half a month for three years. Wow. So I was very lucky I had no growth problems like shin splints or growing pains or Oscars because I think my growth spurt was so constant, it wasn't just a skyrocket, it was just constantly evolving that my body was able to keep up with it. But that hindered coordination, balance, kicking, handling, everything. And it was only the patience of the more senior coaches that allowed me to stay in the game for so long. Because I think each year there was always a question mark. But not until about 16 was I really grown into my body and able to play the football that they knew I could. That's quite... How do you see that, actually? I hadn't thought about that, that going through puberty and those changes where, as you say, your body doesn't coordinate quite yeah, well as it used to. How do you, how do you have amazing. a vision that, oh, it's OK, he's going to come through this, or have you just got to stick with it? Well, we, we were talking about it in the last podcast, about short-term f- fixes and long-term fixes. And what I love there is the, the, the guys that can see is probably more the older heads, I'd mm. assume, that go in, he's fine. He's going to make a mistake the weekend, and he ain't going to get to that ball the weekend, but it's not about the weekend. It's about five years' time, yeah, six yeah. years' time. We see he has the talent, just leave him. He'll be fine. you know. And that's the frustrating thing sometimes with the academy coaches at the minute, that it's about today and tomorrow. And it's not. It's the long-term fix of he will be good. Just leave him alone, he'll be fine. You know, but it's a patience, isn't it? Because, like you say, mm. when you're gangly, I've worked with so many guys that, you know, that age group are gangly, and it's like, you know, the coordination's all over the place. And they'll make some, hor- you probably write a young goalie, you probably make some awful um, mistakes. Yeah. But knowing, the older guy's knowing, he'll be fine. <laughs> he'll come out of that, mm. you know? So it's yeah. a great story to hear that. Brilliant. It's the, sorry, just, it's the ones that are saying, well, he can't kick it. Yeah. That's because he's got no muscle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He can't generate any power yeah. he's just he doesn't know how long his legs are yeah like i used to walk past like tables and just arms just bump them or hit door handles and you think you used to walk past look at it going how have i how hit that, that but yeah. you just had no spatial awareness because you didn't know how long your it's funny because pete i had my scholarship at tottenham and peter crouch mm. was there at the time and but he, his legs were like an inch wide it was mm. crazy yeah, like, yeah he couldn't be any more gangly and you think like well, what a career he had but they were just trusting him and go, he'll be fine. Just keep working in the gym and we'll get him up to scratch, you know? So, mm. yeah, it's, 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 it's brilliant to hear that there's people that trust you at a young age. Mm. Mum so. and dad tall? Not overly. I think I was taller than by 13, 14. My dad's six foot. My mum's probably five, seven. So not crazy tall. Yeah. But I think there might be some height in my family somewhere, like my dad's cousins or something like that. But, yeah... Both my brother and and I are taller than my parents. So, so was so you come through this gangly phase. <laughs> was there a point where something clicked, something changed with you or with the coaches or with the? Or was there where, where where was it when you thought, oh, hang on a second, yeah, this th- is I, all falling into place. I think it was my first year scholarship. I think the growth rate slowed right down. I was able to put on a little bit of size because I was always very lean and skinny, and I think. At that age, my first year scholarship, everything seemed to sort of just click in. I was thrown into the environment at 16. Um, I went on loan to Portsmouth's 18s as a 16-year-old um, because the academy manager wanted me to play scholarship football because he knew that I was going to be a first-year scholar yeah. playing. And it's it's not as rare now, but back then it was rare that a first year scholar would play normally your second year scholars are going to play but for whatever reason I was I was playing and I got sent out on loan to scholarship football early to just taste it and I think that growing up and toughening up really helped and I think that's what really clicked did you stay down there or did you travel up and back it was literally (laughs) just the game just the games dad would 
take me in the car, go to the game, play the game, come back and then train with with Reading at the time. But um, yeah, it was just just the games. So great to get that mm. fundy belt. Yeah, definitely. I think I think looking back, I think the loans that I had all the way through, they change you. They don't. You you have to build yourself up and you have to be confident because you're in an environment that you're not used to. Yeah. You're playing with players that you don't know. And especially you go into a game on a Saturday, you don't know who the back four are. It's like, oh, and you're trying to learn names in the warm-up in the change room beforehand and trying to get used to it. And they're relying on you and you're relying on them to get through the game and you not to make a mistake and them to trust you. So, How does that, I mean, you, Martin talks a lot, you talk a lot about communication, mm. about the keeper being mm. the strong communicator. How does that work in in that context where as you, say, you don't know anybody and here you are potentially trying to command the back four and be, you know, uh, outspoken and, you know, really try and sort of talk. And they're, I mean, are they going, is this geezer? Or, I mean, I, you've got to quickly build a report with them, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I think, for me, I think that's why I talk so much in games now. Um, because I'm being thrown into an environment that I don't know who the people are. So I'm used to just speaking rubbish to them or <laughs> just, just trying to get we're them on side. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just trying to like engage them in the game and with me to trust me by always talking constantly to them, left shoulder, right shoulder, open your body, like just commentating on the game where the strikers are for them to try and build that. And I think within a couple of games, I think it was fine. Um, but it's also in the change room trying to it's always not nice being the first day of school new kid at school kind of thing but you've just got to try and get through that as quickly as possible to build that relationship so one season on loan a couple of seasons on loan how did that play out through your scholarship uh, so the first loan was at 16 to Portsmouth um, then I played in my first year scholarship for Reading um, had some Great memories there. Most of my team are now f flying well beyond their whatever we we dreamed of. And I think teammates, just some shout outs there, the guys uh, that have progressed. My team, Jack Stacey, Bournemouth, um, Rob Dickey, QPR, Dom Heim at Coventry, um, Tariq just signed at Stoke, Tariq Fosse, that is. Um, yeah, there's, there's two, like my t that age group two-year age group was very good like very good um, and then I had my first senior loan sort of back end of that season to Whitehawk played in the fourth round qualifying game um, FA Cup and that was I thought wow men's football is tough <laughs> really we um, it was obviously a, it's a big game because you go through you in the first round of the FA Cup and I don't think at that stage I realised how big of a occasion it was and we were 2 nil down at half time and the manager came for me at half time and I was 17 I was thinking hang on a minute no 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 I thought I've got I've got to try and like puff my chest out here because I'm not having this and I said no 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 it's the defender's fault it's not mine and he went what I went no it's a wide free kick along the floor if everyone's running across me I've got to try and cover the near post because one toe it's obviously going yeah. there and it's gone along the floor could have cleared about eight people. Just swing your right foot at it and it's gone. And it's gone into the bottom corner. And he's tried to go to me, well, why haven't you saved it? I said, mm, because everyone's run across me and I've got to go with the runs. Otherwise, so why have your defenders not cleared it? So that was that sorted. Um, second half came up. We went 4-3 up with probably 10 minutes to go. I've saved the penalty at 4-3. Fantastic. And they scored the rebound. No. But none of none of the players have run in. Only their players have followed up the rebound. We've come in after the game, and he's gone. The manager's gone. He's had a great performance today. <laughs> he saved the penalty, and all of you are watching. We better go win the replay on Tuesday night. Yeah, and I was thinking I've just conceded four in my first like senior game. I'm like, what's gone on here? <laughs> and um, <laughs> we went to the replay on Tuesday night and lost four one. Wow. So I've conceded eight in. <laughs> two games I'm thinking men's football is horrible yeah and like you, you don't realise we're playing at Chelmsford and the fans are you're taking a goal kick and fans can 
grab you. Like they're that close to you behind the goal. They and you can hear everything. And um, Sal was in the crowd with the uh, the academy goalie coach at the time, and they said they just stood there listening to everything, and they said that they saw something in me when I went to get the ball from the crowd and that you're getting abused, they're throwing like just insults at you and they said you were just cold, like just didn't phase you and we thought, yeah, that's that's when we knew like you could go on and kick on because if you're not getting phased by that when you come to a stadium where you can't hear the individual insults, yeah. you're not gonna worry about it. So Yeah, yeah that was a, a man up kind of moment I know you can't say that anymore sorry brilliant but though so good, but what a great yeah it was kind of a couple like a, of great yeah, stories there at 17 up. yeah to learn those skills but obviously it sounds like you had the skills was that focus was that or did you was it a natural ability to sort of distance yourself? How, how do you how do you do that I don't know if you can kind of teach it it's kind of sink or swim really I, I don't know what you think from a coach's point mm. of view but you either get survive the environment or you don't um, and I think coming through sort of the generation of scholarship where it was kind of on the verge of being changed to what it is now we still got locked in the boot room if the boot room wasn't if your boots were <laughs> like wet and dirty before training like yeah. it was that kind of environment still yeah. and we had all the jobs where you had to clean the kitchen clean the paths clean all the boots clean the balls and we still had a lot of responsibility and I think that kind of grounding as a youth team player really helps. Do you, yeah, how do you, what advice do you give as a coach to a 17 year old in that context that I you're going to get a lot of abuse this game? The part of the, the loan structure that, that I put in place was partly for that, mm. that the boys go out, that they don't, they don't know anyone. You know, deal with it. And I think sometimes that can go to your advantage. You don't know no one. You're there to do a job. You've got a road. To, you're trying to get to the end of the road. Um, and the aim is a professional contract at some point. And when you don't know anyone, I think your focus slightly adjusts even more to your favour. I think when you know a group, there's always that, that element of, like, being accepted. You know, because you spend a lot of time together, don't you? Mm. As, a scholar, as a scholarship, you spend a lot of time together. So I think to go out and learn, especially with the crowds and stuff, how they work. I always said to the boys that if they manage to go up the levels, it will become easier. Because like you say, you stand out there, you're not hearing Dave behind the goal with his chips and his fag in his mouth shouting at you. You can't hear anything. You just hear a roar. So, you know, it, it does get, it becomes easier. Mm. You know, it does become easier. Um, but no, the, the, the social element of going out alone is absolutely priceless. And like you said with the scholarship thing, why they stop doing that is absolutely beyond me. You know, they can't do any jobs and you can't do any responsibility. But for what reason? You know, it, it was crazy when they changed the rules. Madness. You know, because what was the harm in you cleaning the balls and, you know, some of the turnstiles and, you know, I, I didn't see the issue in that. Okay, could some pros go a little bit too far and, like you say, they lock you in a dress room... Yeah. Maybe, maybe, but it was in house. Yeah. There weren't no Twitter and Facebook. There was none of that. Yeah. So it's yeah. like if it goes too far, fine. As coaches, we'll see it and we'll manage it. But I think it was nuts that they decided to try to take all that out. Absolutely madness. Um, but now the loan thing for me is 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 phenomenal. I think it really makes. I think it makes a goalie. I generally do. You know, you think playing at sixteen in front of what. 40 people at a training ground and then stepping in here two years mm. later without playing in a ground. Yeah. Oh, can you imagine how, yeah. how you, you couldn't cope with that? Yeah, no matter how mentally strong you are, you're not no. coping with it. No. So a gradual build-up is brilliant. So, and allow yourself to make mistakes as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think... I think Great chance to make mistakes in front of 30 people, 80 people, yeah. 120 people. You, can, you find your limitations. For mm. example, you come for crosses, if you yeah. get underneath them or yeah. you, you don't quite make it. As harsh as it is, you will help the loan clubs you're going for, money-wise, mm. player-wise. You, you're filling that gap. But ultimately, you are a stepping stone. You're using them as well as they're using yeah. you. Um, and I think that's what I kind of learned later on with a few more loans that I had was lower down, you're there to make mistakes. The higher up you go, you're, you're learning consistency. Yeah, You're learning to play week in, week out. You're learning to 
be that seven out of ten every week to build that consistency to get that run of games to get that form to ultimately help the team out throughout the whole season mm. yeah. so we're back back to the story we're 17 18 now we're learning next chapter next chapter so as a first year I obviously played a scholarship the second year I thought I was going to play 21s I was told you're going to step up you're going to be the 21s keeper um, and the year before the, the senior goalie above me played in the Conference South got player of the year in Conference South which is remarkable for a goalkeeper to get yeah. player of the season across everyone as a goalie like yeah. that's very rare very unheard of um, and he was set on finding a League 2 loan which is a big jump from Conference yeah. South and he was turning down Conference loans which in the end cost me because he didn't want to go and play in Conference because he thought he was ready for League 2 but then the backlog of that I didn't find a loan because I thought I was playing 21s because he was turning down loans he played 21s and I had to sit the bench again so that season I didn't play a lot of 21s football, got a few games in, played the scholarship again. Um, and at the end of the summer, we had a pre-season friendly against an Icelandic team. Um, Herman Haridesson was the manager. We had Hayden Mullins at the club, who was new, ha um, new Herman from Portsmouth. And he was saying they were asking for a goalie. And I was like, I haven't played a lot of football this year. I will happily go out and play over the summer. And it kind of snowballed into that scenario where I ended up going out to Iceland for 12, 16 weeks, I think it was, in the end. Wow, how um, was that? It was an experience. That was, <laughs> that was probably the best thing to kind of get to. I was, the first kind of week, I was, didn't have any accommodation. I was sleeping in Herman's house on, on a mattress, which was, which was an experience. And played a couple of games, which was obviously a challenge because of the language barrier. A lot of them speak English out there, but... Obviously, it's not their natural language, but they understand English. So I'm yeah. communicating them in English, but they're turning around and shouting back to me in Icelandic. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, right. So you understand me, but I don't understand you. So it was kind of trying to cross that boundary. Um, and I kind of found out that I played the first sort of three games, four games, and I kind of then worked out that I was getting used to kind of push their other goalie. So I was used. I was brought in to make sure their other goalie worked harder and played better. So in in that into his head, bit of a threat. But oh, we've, yeah. got, we've got another keeper in here. Yeah. Just, so yeah, I, played keep him on his toes. I played the first three. Um, did all right. Did okay. Um, then we had a cup game. The other goalie played. Won the cup game. The goalie stays in. And then I was like, right, okay, my time in Iceland's done then. So I played a lot of their youth team games because I was just happy to play football at that point. I didn't play a lot over the last year. Played a couple of games in the league, played um, for their reserves, played, I sort of had sort of eight games in sort of 12 weeks, which isn't too bad for over a summer as well. So came back, had sort of two, three weeks off, went back into training at Reading and then went on loan straight away into Conference South with uh, Margate, which was a good experience, really enjoyed it. The, the Icelandic move helped you get that move, presumably? Uh, so I, don't, I don't think it not? did. I don't no, think okay. it did. Um, it definitely prepared me for the move, um, but it didn't get me the move. I think it was kind of lined up and the clubs were kind of speaking before that anyway. Right. But I don't think it was um, I don't think it was Iceland that helped me get that move, but it might have swayed and think, well, he's gone out there, played a bit, he can cope with this environment here. Uh, and I think that definitely was an eye-opener at Margate. It was sort of 700, 800 people every week. and Who's the manager? Nicky Ball. It was Nicky Ball. It was Nicky Ball, yeah. 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 They're, they're, it was a bad season that season. So I think, looking back, I think going out to Iceland and not having that time off, I ended up pulling my quad in October, I think it was. Right. About sort of 15 games in, I felt it ping in like the 70th minute. But Nicky Ball was the manager and he was also the second goalie. And he's on the touchline in a suit. <laughs> and I've gone, my quad's gone here. It's, it's gone ping. And they're like, and? I'm not getting changed. There's 20 minutes left. Like, So I'm having to take goal kicks with a ripped quad of how, whatever grade it was. I can't remember what it was at the time. I don't think it was, I think it was 
a two or something, but still I'm taking goal kicks and expecting to kick it when you it's gone. Couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that that obviously set me back and um, I had to repair that. But I think not having the time off kind of... So it, Iceland helped in a way because I grew up again. It was another experience. But it may have hindered the fact that I hadn't recovered enough to play next season. All being said, I don't know if going into Conference South where a team does play a lot more longer balls than academy football, would that have had a fact to pay because I'm not used to kicking that kind yeah. of volume of balls. Mm. So I don't I I don't know what the what the scenario was, I don't know what the issue was, but I think it was a factor of not having a summer off plus playing a lot of academy football and then going into a team that does kick it a lot longer and is you are expected to have that consistency of hitting it seventy yards for ninety minutes. Mm. Uh, and then they had a I obviously I pulled my quad and they had a very bad run. A very bad run. I think they went twenty games with not scoring a goal. Presumably the manager didn't step in as keeper. They got a keeper in. No, they got a keeper something. in. Yeah, yeah, they got a keeper in. Um, I think one of the younger Reading goalies went because I actually had concussion sort of 10, 10 games before pulling my quad with Margate. <laughs> right. um, I still don't remember the game. Still have no memory of the game at all. Um, I remember coming out for the tunnel, shaking hands, hearing the ref's whistle go, and I've got nothing until I'm sat in the change room my parents were sitting across me and like, lights come back on. I was like, what are you doing in here? Why are you, why are you in the change room? And they're like, are you all right? I'm like, why wouldn't I be? Really? And apparently I got, um, took a knock 15 minutes in, um, answered all the physios, concussion questions, everything. Um, my parents could see from the sideline that I wasn't okay, but because the club didn't know me as a person as much as my parents, didn't see like the little signs that I wasn't wasn't okay, and um, I think coming at half time changed their view because they asked me what the score was, and I said it was nil nil. We're still in the game, and we were two nil down. <laughs> Class. <laughs> um, apparently, I've been booked, conceded two goals, hadn't a clue, and then next thing I know, I'm sat in the changing room, my parents across me, paramedics taking my blood pressure, and I'm looking around going, "What's happening? What's going on? Yeah. What's up?" So yeah, I think I think the Reading goalie. Went in, he played the game while I was, because obviously concussion protocols, you have to go through 10 days and um, all of that. And he stepped in then, so I think he stepped in after that. And then they got another couple in. And then went back in January after this horrible, like, long streak of losses. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be busy. Um, played the first three. We lost 1-0, 2-0. Then we played East. I remember the night we played East Thurrock away, um, and we conceded a header in the 87th minute to go one 0 And we were coming off the game dejected because we thought we were so close to getting a point. Nicky Ball's coming in, gone, lads. That's me done. I've had enough. You've ruined my managerial career. Um, yeah, see you later. Walked out. Never saw him again. Um, <laughs> which was for a young. Young player on loan, I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. what's going on here? Yeah. Um, and I've never had a manager change before. So I was a bit shocked. I didn't know what to expect because I was still on loan. Um, next thing, new manager came in, played the first game. He was speaking to Reading going, not sure we're having him. He's not really for us, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, well, he said, well, keep him in for the next couple, see what happens. Um, so the, this is the fifth game in that run. We got nil nil draw, played reasonably well, got a clean sheet. So I was pleasant. They were like, "Oh yeah, okay, yeah, we can see potential. Maybe we'll keep him for another couple of weeks." Next game, two nil win. So the teams had four points the last two games. Scored their first goal in four months, not conceded in two. They're like, "Yeah, we wanted to stay. He's going to keep us up." I was like, "Hang on a minute, four, what, two games ago, you didn't want you, me." Yeah, yeah. Um, so fickle, huh? And then. It turned out that someone else in the league, higher up, challenging for playoffs, needed a goalie. Ended up going there. <laughs> but it, that's just how football works. And we uh, we had sort of 10 game run, closing the season off. And I think uh, I think we kind of like 
one six drew three. Where missed. was that? It was at Hungerford. Okay. Uh, and we missed out on the playoffs by one point, but the team in the playoffs couldn't go in because they didn't have enough seats for the playoffs because you need a certain number of seats for the crowd for the playoffs. So we were one point out, so we thought, oh, we're in, we're in the playoffs. Turns out we were 100 seats short as well, so we didn't get in either. <laughs> <laughs> Just can't see, sir. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, yeah, you look at it and think, what an easy yeah. situation yeah, that could absolutely. have been resolved. I don't know what the money situation was at the time, but I think for the sake of potentially going into the playoffs, I think 100 seats might have been yeah. worth it. A little but investment. Um, but I guess that's lower league football, isn't it? That's the, that's the, those, I think the, it, yeah. those are the little micro decisions mm. that whoever makes yeah. them or can't make them, you can't afford to make them. And, you know, you th- we, we sit and go 100 seats, but I don't know, maybe it's three grand, five grand, ten grand. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah exactly. Who may, knows? You know, so if they don't have five grand, ten grand, two grand, whatever it is. you Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then following that, um, I had the summer off. I thought that would be the best. <laughs> um, came back. And obviously, I wanted to step into Conference Prem. Thought I'd played enough games in Conference South that season. Um, but Reading were adamant, no, you're not You're not ready for that yet. You're not going to Conference Prem. We want you to have another stint in Conference South. Frustrating as that is, I understood. I had to get my head around it. Went back to Hungerford. Um, <laughs> five Still 100 seats, 100 seats short. Still 100 seats short. Yeah. So I thought, not going to get the playoffs no matter what. Yeah. Um, but start of the season, very well, I thought, um, flying. We had first two games, two wins, two clean sheets. Good, uh, sorry, win, two clean sheets, very good start. Uh, then it kind of like dipped a little bit as you get a little bit giddy at the start maybe. Um, and then the fifth game in, we were, we were at Welling away. And um, manager comes in at half-time. We're 3-1 down. Um, manager comes in at half-time and goes, Boys, yeah, um, I don't want to say this before the game, but um, I'm leaving. Um, I've had enough. I need to go spend time with my family. I've been at this club a long time. Everyone's like, it's half time. Like, <laughs> we're 3-1 down. We kind of need, this isn't like the time for this talk. Like, even if we lost, fair enough, at the end of the game. It's like, yeah, go out after the game and win me the second half so I can go out on a high. Everyone's like... It's an interesting motivational Everyone, chat, isn't it? Everyone's head was baffled. Like, I don't think anyone clearly thought about the second half after that. Everyone was kind of thinking, where's the club going from here? Um, we lost the game 3 2, but we scored. We won the second half, which he wanted. So, um, I don't know how you take that. And he said that he was taking time out from football. Um, I got a call on the Tuesday morning saying, I'm signing for another club. I want to take you with me. I was like, hang on a minute. Two days ago, you said you were (laughs) taking time away. Um, I said, I appreciate the call, but I can't go with you. Um, If I sign another youth loan, that's another 30 days where I can't step into the conference. So if I keep rolling it with Hungerford, I don't have to worry about that first 30 days because it's already passed. I can just keep going and I can leave whenever something comes up. Oh, like is that how it works? Ex- just explain that so to, the, to, to the our viewers loans, listeners who don't really understand yeah, that. Yeah, so the youth loans at the time, I don't know if they're still the same, I'm not sure, but if you're under the age of 21, um, you sign a youth loan at a club, the first 30 days you can't be recalled, um, but after that 30 days you can be recalled at whatever point, but you don't have to, if you sign an extension, you don't have to wait another 30 days to be recalled. Okay. It's just that initial... So you just keep it rolling. Yeah, it's just that initial 30 days. Um, and I was thinking with in mind, I wanted to step into Conference Prem. Um, so I thought, if something comes up in the next month, if I sign another, I can't go anywhere. Yeah. So I thought, I'll just stay at Hungerford, um, get game time, get everything that I need to um, at the club, experiences and... I know the lads, I don't need to go into another dressing room, I don't need to mm. introduce myself again, don't need to be that first first boy at school again. So I kind of stayed at the club, um, and then by the start of November, Aldershot came calling, which was what I was hoping for and what I was after. So I managed to recall my Hungerford loan and step into Aldershot's team, which was one of the 
highlights of I'd say my career so far of being in that team. Fantastic. Yeah, it was. But then the flip side of that, you go from playing the two hundred and fifty people at Hungerford, and the first game at Aldershot was Memorial Weekend, and it's a army base, army town. There's four and a half thousand people in the EBB Stadium, if it's still called that. Um, and yeah, it was it was a hell of an experience to change from sort of that kind of environment to the bigger. This is this is professional. But it sounds like you were ready for that. You had the mindset for that. You were comfortable. It, it wasn't a like we were saying earlier, mm. two three years earlier, it would have been a massive shock for yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah. you know, you you you've been out alone. You've seen some bizarre um, uh, manager resignations. You've, you've been in front of different crowds. You've had Dave, Dave and his dog. Um, Dave and his dog. Dave and his dog shouting at oh, fag and his man shouting at you. So you, I guess you would, you didn't feel uncomfortable at all in that environment. No, no, no. And I think, I think, coming through non-league from certain clubs, and you start to appreciate the little things at a club. And I think turning up at Aldershot, it felt more like a professional club. It was a, it was full time. It was a more professional outfit. It had its training ground. It had a kit man. It was kind of, and I'm not knocking non-league because non-league develops players and it, you grow up a lot and it, when you experience the experiences that I have, it helps you. But I think a lot of people don't understand the trials of what non-league has to offer, as in washing your own kit, training on school pitches at evenings and having to make sure that you get out of work at the right time to make sure you're there for training and if you're not there at the right time or if you're late, there's no light because there's no floodlights or you've got to try and find a training pitch that has floodlights in the in the winter months. So I think a lot of pro players don't understand what non-league is. And as we've said, the loan system, I think mm. it builds people up so much and gets them ready for professional life as a professional footballer. But it gives you the grounding of that this is the reality of non-league football, yeah. which people don't understand if they've been at top academies all their life, and if they're suddenly thrown into that environment because they've not been offered a contract or anything, they don't know how to cope with it. I think uh, presumably going full-time also is the... Um, yeah, yeah, does it feel different? Does it feel... You know, I was talking, we had Matt Gold on here, who's at Altrincham, They've gone full time football this mm. season. They weren't last year. It's just, it's it's there's a buzz around it. We're back, mm. we're good, we're sort of we're doing what we've aspired to do, what we've trained to do, what we want to do, and you and you're in and you're working full time in, in what you want to do. So I, I guess there's a real element there that makes it Yeah, I think I, th I think definitely. I think obviously you you train full time as a scholarship, but as a scholarship it's more you tr you're striving to get to the goal. Yeah. Whereas when you're on loan you get thrown into that environment, you're full time, you're with people that have coming down, you're with people that are trying to get back up. Um, but at the end of the day, it's their job and they are you are relying on each other for that extra the extra brown envelope mm. for a clean sheet for a win. And it's a lot more real because it is livelihoods on the line at the yeah. end of the day because it is their full-time jobs whereas Conference South and Lower again not knocking it they all have second jobs they all come to football in the evenings and Tuesday, Thursday play on a Saturday and it's not their full-time job but going into the Conference Prem you're, you're scrapping for everything it's your job you are trying to progress if for like me I was young trying to step up the ladder or for the boys that are coming down the ladder Again, they still want to do as well as they can because they've been at those championship League One clubs and they've seen what it should be. And coming here, they expect the same and they want the same. So, yeah, it is it is definitely more real when you go full-time properly in the club. Probably the highlight of my career, Aldershot. One of, one of them, yeah. I think Because? I think, I think the way the group was, it was a special group. The change room was very. It was one of the best change rooms I've been in. Um, it was 
a case of everyone was as I, like fighting together for the same goal, and it wasn't you didn't have too many egos, you didn't have the ones that stood out and kind of disrupted. It was everyone was very grounded and wanted the goal, and I think the, the boys did a lot together and went out for meals. We had a dartboard in the change room, and after training we had dart championships. Everyone would come in and. You'd have your walk-on music. If you got knocked out, you'd have to sit and watch the rest of the championship and stuff like that. So it was a very together group. And I think that came from the management down because the manager was a very good man manager. It was very well organised and there was a lot of trust between the management to the players. And it's very rare to have that where players are so open with the actual manager yeah normally it's an assistant it's a goalie coach you get the comments and they try and feed them back but the group was very open with the manager and he was very open with the group which was how it worked and why it worked so well who was the manager gary waddock that was gary yeah um and we we managed to get to the playoffs and unfortunately lost to ebsfleet in the um quarterfinals but like it was one of the experiences that i will that run of games was one of the sort of like we played nice football it was just enjoyable and that's why you're in football but you had your head still looking forward you were still thinking okay I'm loving this yeah you I, you didn't want to stay in that you you were you were, you were on the way up well I was I was hoping Aldershot got promoted and I can go back to Aldershot in League 2 yeah I think that was that was the ultimate plan was win the playoffs and get promoted from the conference to League Two and get sent back on loan to Aldershot. That was the plan. Um, it didn't happen and I think sort of that run of games allowed me to have interest from League Two anyway. Um, and I unfortunately was slowed up. I think we spoke about it off, off, uh, off mic and I was told I was number three at Reading at the time. Um, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere unless they brought another another goalie in. And we, uh, I think what really frustrated me that summer was we went to Austria on tour, which is lovely. You're on tour with the first team. It's nice. It's um, The second choice goalie got injured in the second day and we had two games coming up. And I thought, well, these are the first games that we've been playing of pre-season. I played 10 minutes of those two games and I thought, well, that's that's how you see me then. Like I am. Um, I, I need I need development. I'm yeah. not ready. I get that. I understand. That's fine. So I was pushing this loan. I had a, I had North Northampton lined up beforehand, and um, I spoke to the manager at the time before preseason even started. He said he wanted me to come in, wanted me to challenge, wanted me to fight, which is perfect because no one expects to walk into a League Two team with no experience. So. Um, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Had it all lined up and obviously Reading slowed it and slowed it um, until the last week of the window. It all went through, which was great. Um, obviously, understanding, um, I know that I'm not going to start the season because I haven't played any games with the with the team. Yeah. He's done The other goalie's done very well in pre-season. He deserves to start the season. Not a problem. I'll play the Carabao Cup and uh, play the Papa John's and then we'll go from there and see how the season's going. So, made my full professional debut at Adams Park against Wickham. Um, lost on penalties, which seems to be the story of my <laughs> career. Um, but yeah, we I, did, I thought I had a good game. Really enjoyed like sort of getting that little professional debut ticked off, and it was really enjoyable. And I think stepping forward, I think going forward, I was looking at the games, thinking, can I go knock on his door yet? Can I go knock on his door yet? And we were picking up points here and there where if we'd lost I could go knock it but we were just scraping by scraping by and it was yeah so I had no real reason to go knock on the door because he was doing okay it wasn't kind of a goalie error it was defensive it was team cohesion it was and the one opportunity that I really saw to go knock on the door he got sacked the next day <laughs> new manager comes in keeps the same team changes formation changes style get a clean sheet and they want nil nil he's not going to change it again is he because he's so yeah that was kind of a frustrating couple of months and after that it kind of all spiralled out of control at Northampton um, 
How do you, I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued you're taking this as well. This knocking on the door scenario. Who's, is anybody helping you, mentoring you, giving you advice? Where does that come from? You know, you're still a young player, you're still learning the ropes. That line between, when you see it in the, in, in, in the workplace, if you like, that line between sort of knocking on the door and asking for a promotion, which is mm. what you're doing, and I'm not quite sure and I'm not doing it and when to do it. Because on the one hand, you don't want to be seen as being this pushy, no, get off, kind mm. of kid. But on the other hand, sometimes the pushy kid works and gets in and ha what's that? How does that play out? I think out there has to be the a game? balance. There's got to be a balance of it. And I think timing's massive. I've seen players like technically knocking on the door just five minutes before kickoff and they're fuming because they're not starting the game. You know, the timing's horrendous. Like, but is, is it's a waste of time. You know, can you court the coaches? And could, I mean, do the, are the coaches. Is that a side door in where you go, oh, Martin, I'll have a word. Come on, I'm playing. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think... I'm, you know, come on, I should... Or do you go... Especially with goalies, you can... I mean, like, with Gary, I worked with Gary Waddock for, for, for two years and he was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And obviously, Nicky Ball, weirdly enough, mm. was, was the goalie yeah. for one of the years that I worked with him. Um, or two years, sorry. It was full two years with him. Um, and you, some things, as, as, as a goalie coach, you have to smooth some things out, you know? A lot of them don't. There's lots of them that don't, but some, you know, so for example, in that situation, you're going, yeah, that's fine. We all know you want to play. Gavin's really pleased the way you're training. Um, he's just not going to change it, mm. you know. But when, especially when you look at results, even when the team win, sometimes you feel as the goalie, you can't knock on the door as a second choice. But then who's to say why you can't? Well, that's kind of where you I'm could still have had an absolute. From. You could have an absolute beast. But... For me, there has to be a balance because I think if you if you knock too much and you're on them all the time, I think it goes against you immensely, mm. you know. Um, but then if you don't knock, after a while they're going perfect. I've got a really good number two who's really content. I've had it off here because I've got number one who's doing well. I've got number two who's just as good as number one, and he's happy being it. So there has to be there has to be a balance with it. But the staff have to take a bit of responsibility to try and help the manager out. You know, absorb some of it for them. And some of them, listen, some of them go the other way and <laughs> set the fire even higher. Yeah. And make it even, oh, yeah, I think you should play. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so just kind of winding there. the keeper up. Because yeah. he could go in and go, well, hold on a minute, you'll go to coach that I should be playing. Yeah, which he's going to deny. You've done yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 So you, you, there has to be a it's, a, it's a fine balance. It is a fine balance. But I think when you said you haven't, the, the biggest thing you said there for me is when you say you, there wasn't, you're a young guy that hasn't had much experience. That's the part I would then disagree with. Because mm. I think you have had a good experience. Yeah, You've yeah. had a nice build up, mm. and you're going, no, 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 I'm ready, I'm ready to go. Mm. So, yeah, the timing is, the timing is right. See, see, for me, and again, just stepping out of the conversation slightly, all the conversations you and I have about the pathway and the mm. loan system and being ready to make that move, Lewis has done that up until yeah. that point yeah then it be, then what what changes okay manager changes a bit unlucky but that changes yeah Is it, but what else what are those other factors that suddenly make it really tough to oh there's so many factors yeah. so many because there could be someone that you know i've i'd heard stories that someone won't take someone else on loan because that person's heard from someone else that they didn't like him in the dressing room it's like, is that person me? That's yeah, point blank. <laughs> so we're not taking him because of that. Well, that's that's crazy. Yeah. You know. Well, I've heard through this person and this person that, that they're not good with their left foot. Well, do stop being lazy. Do the research yourself, and if you're happy, you're happy. Be your own person. But there is so many things that can go against, you know, the next step. You know, and there's always a next step, isn't there? Let's be honest. Yeah. There's always a next step. You play Premier League, then all of a sudden you want to be an international, an international. Yeah. So there's always a next step for you. Um, but I think the point is, the biggest learning curve for me has been, if you are a consistent person, you give yourself the best opportunity. If there's too many highs and lows as a personality and character, that will go, I think that goes against you massively. Okay. Massively. So Which back to the, so we're Northampton, we're thinking it was looking good. Suddenly. Yeah, suddenly it's not, and it's, it's all snowballed from there. I've, I mean, you speaking about people not speaking or 
spreading stories and stuff, I I I just assumed it was about me because Northampton kind of snowballed into a really sticky situation. I was kind of left to my own devices to deal with it as well. Reading didn't really help me at the time and it kind of got to the point where I was considering going to the PFA. Um, I mean, I got a call from, we were off on the Monday, I got a call from Reading saying, um, we've been told that Northampton aren't going to play you and you can come back. I've gone, okay, well, that's the first I've heard of it. We're, in, we're off today. Let me go speak to them tomorrow. Let me, let me go work out what's going on. So I spoke to them in the morning, Tuesday. I said, look, you're on loan here. Um, you're not going to play. There's no point you being here. You might as well go back to Reading. Um, you might as well just terminate the loan, get it all sorted. I said, like, I understand that respectfully, but I'd wish you'd spoken to me first. Like, I'm getting calls from Reading saying, you're never going to play. That's news to me. I need. I wish you'd come to me first, and then sure. we could have spoken to them together, yeah. and we could have smoothed smoothed it over. So, um, I had a bit of you can call it head loss, you can call it whatever. I I wasn't I wasn't the best trainer that week. Let's put it that way. And I know that myself, and I know I could have handled it differently, and I would have handled it better having been in that situation before. It was the first time that has ever happened to me, um, and I. Yeah, so that happened and I had a bad couple of days training, um, went back in on the Friday, was a lot better on Friday, felt better in myself personally and was trying to just do the best because there's a game next day, you can't try and bring everyone else down on a Friday because you're not feeling great. So trying to be better on the Friday and everything, so I had a better day. Uh, was in the shower after training and um goalie coach came in and uh, said, the manager wants to see you now. Okay, can I dry off? Can I get the bubbles out of my hair? Can I go put some clothes on? He said, no, no, he wants to see you now. Okay, okay. So all the boys are like, you won't go there in the towel. I was like, well, I kind of have to. Like, he's just called me in. So I've gone in in my towel and my flip-flops, still holding my bubble gum soap or whatever it is, and sat down, dripping. I've gone, Gaffer, do you want me to go put some clothes on or just put a T-shirt on or something? He said, no, you, you can drip dry. And I've gone, okay, cool. Bit weird. Um... And then he's gone, so, how are you feeling? I thought, oh, I said, okay. That's not how I thought the conversation was going to go, but I thought, perfect. Like, that, what, what a great start to a conversation because it's personal. You're asking me how I'm feeling. So I said, Gaffer, I'm struggling. Um, I'm struggling to get motivated. You, you, you told me I'm never going to play, like, ever. Like, I'm, I'm really struggling here. And then I can't say what he said to me on camera, but explicits were used. I was called stuff and it just s s snowballed. I was just, my back was up. I was like, hang on a minute, what? Like, you can't call up to me for no reason. Um, so, yeah, so he's, he's called me whatever he's called me and I've kind of had my back up and he said I was disrupting the dressing room, disrupting training and... I'm not a disruptor. Like I trained badly, I'll hold my hands up to that. I know I did. But I'm not going to go spread rumours to the lads. I'm not going to go incite treason and start mutinies and stuff like that. That's not what I'm about. So, And I've, I'm on loan as well. I've got no need to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm sat there getting grilled. And I'm like, okay. And I'm still dripping wet at this time as well. And I've gone, can I have some examples, please? because I'm struggling to work out what's wrong. Like I, I know I've had a bad training session the other day because I missed some serves or I didn't do what you asked me to do because whatever I chanked to serve, I missed the target and trying to work the goalie. Fine, everyone does that, but I was express. I know I was bad. Um, so he's gone, um, he's gone to the goalie coach. Yeah, yeah, give him some examples. And he's gone, uh, you were wearing your snood too high. I was like... <sighs> Sorry? What? He said, yeah, you were in your snoo too high. It was right above, above your eye, like above your nose. All you could see was your eyes. Um, and I was thinking, it's been minus two this week. He said, well, you don't see players in the Prem doing that. I said, all you see in the Prem is their eyes because they've got hats on and snoods, then a snood over the hat. Like, it, it, I just went, right, okay. And then conversation carried on. 
Um, and he said, I don't want you in the dressing room tomorrow. I don't want you anywhere near the squad. Don't want you going on the Christmas do. Wow. Don't want you around the boys. Um, I went, okay. Got up, got back in the shower. Um, <laughs> got changed. Um, went to my flat in Northampton. Packed up most of my stuff that I could fit in my car. Drove it back to my parents. Was ringing agent, reading, goalie coaches on the way home going, I, I know I had one bad session, but I don't think I warrant this. Um, and then they were like, well, go back in when the next in and see what happens. I was like, okay. So I went back in on the Wednesday, trained better on the Wednesday, Was got my head around what was going on, just tried to get my head down, work hard, didn't really speak to anyone and just got through the training sessions as best I could. Um, squad list came out for the game, wasn't in it again. I said, um, I said to the goalie coach going, look, I, I know I, I've trained better this week, why am I not in the squad? He said, well, he's done nothing wrong, the third choice, that is. Um, I can't take him out of the squad. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, I said, okay, I'll see you Monday. He went, and then it took about two hours to reply. I said, um, I'll let you know about Monday. Um, I'll text you when you're next back in. And then never heard a word from him again. I was like, okay. So I went back to Reading, kind of said, like, this is the situation, what's going on? Trained two weeks back at Reading, and they said, um, legally, you can't be back here because your insurance purpose is saying you need to train in Northampton. And they said, you can train with the 18s, but as long as you're getting training, mm. that's fine. So, okay, it's fine. I'll go back to Northampton and train. Um, so on the day that I meant to go back in, it was, it was Thursday evening, I remember it. I was sat at home, um, got a call from an unknown number, thinking, I think this is the manager here. Answer the call. He's my best friend. Oh, how have you been? Like, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. We don't need to come in tomorrow. Don't need to worry about it. I said, look, with all due respect, I understand I understand wh where you're coming from. But Reading have said that I legally need to come in because of the insurance purposes, because of everything. And then he just switched. He's like, I've got some guy, big shot at Reading, thinks he's better than me, hmm, right. trying to throw his weight around. And he was like, I, I said, like, with all due respect, that's nothing to do with me. I've been told what to do. I'm just trying to get through this as best I can. He went, right, if you come in tomorrow, you'll run around the pitch. So went in tomorrow, ran around the pitch. That's all he said I could do. Wasn't allowed to train. And then Reading were going, legally, they can't make you do that. We'll sue them, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, great. So got out of Northampton, was driving back home. Got a call from Reading saying, can you come to the training ground, please? Um, we can sign your release papers. You're going to Forest Green. And I was like, thank you. That's the best news that I've heard for six months, basically. Um, he said, you're not going to go in and start, but their goalies, they had a lone goalie from Brighton. He's gone back. They need another one to come in and challenge. Um, but we think you're a good fit for it and you can go there. And then... I mean, what a, I mean, how hard was that as a six months? I mean, men, the mental strain there I think is pretty, from what you've described, must have been really tough to deal with. Yeah, I think, I, th I think living in my flat on my own didn't help. I think living in away from home for the probably the first proper time. You can say Iceland, I was living away from home, but it wasn't. It was, it was twelve weeks. You knew that we were going back. This was potentially a eight to nine month loan season long and you know what's you, but I think I think being left to my own devices and then in the end Reading kind of just trying to throw their weight about at the time was one of the main issues because um, I felt like I was kind of a pawn not being valued by the club and just trying to be used as a way to exploit the other club in the end which didn't sit right with me at the time but it was what it was and I think that kind of scenario has helped me this last season because I was playing every six to eight weeks I'd never done that before and I was playing Papa John's every couple of weeks and trying to get ready for those games and trying to enjoy those games um, which helped me last season so I think as much as you can say that it was a stress and it, was, it wasn't it was great at the time, but looking back, there were elements of that that have helped me. And I think it taught me a lot to um, deal with managers and goalie coaches that you didn't trust. 
and you knew that the goalie coach was taking what you said and feeding it back in a completely different context to what you were saying. And I think that's one of the main things at a club that you need. You need that trust between the goalie coach. It's a more personal relationship, a goalie coach to a goalie than an mm. outfield coach to a player. Yeah. They've got to deal with 20, 25 people. A goalie coach, maximum you have is four. Yeah. And you probably, one of those is potentially a scholar anyway. So it's more of a personal relationship. And if you don't have that, it's a very, very lonely place because you've got no one to confide in. You've got no one to speak to about stuff. So that time, it did, it was tough. It was very tough, but I've managed to get through it. And I think the Forest Green loan was just a massive weight lifted off my chest. Did you question what you what you were doing? Do I want to be a pro? Do I want to stick with this? Was there ever a point I'm, where you thought this I is never, this is I just never, not worth it? I never I never thought that it was never worth it. I thought this is a one off manager, it's a one off goalie coach. I don't think it's ever gonna be like that. I know the goalie coach is still bad mouthing me to this day. Like we're four years down the line. Like <laughs> let it go. Like it's done. I know that I was trained badly, but the story keeps getting wilder and wilder each time I hear it. And I'm hearing it through people that there's no need to be relaying the story to, which is very strange. Yeah. Um, and it's just one of those where I'm thinking, just let it go. Because whenever I see you, you want to shake my hand and say, like, all the best and how are you? So, like, just Me leave on. it alone, yeah. basically. Um, but no, I think I never, I never questioned about being football, um, being a pro, because I thought this is just, as I said, a one-off. I think it's a, it's a minor setback. It's a learning curve. Um, it's an experience that I need to put to the side, learn from, and just make sure I don't get in that situation again. Um, but as I said, with the relief of Forest Green coming through, it was just knew I could go somewhere and. Not have a fresh start, but just enjoy football again, which was the main thing. It's interesting because I think about it, and you think about at that level and that stage in your career, the power or lack of that a young player mm. has, and then you look at the complete other end of the scale, at the Ronaldo scenario, for example, at the moment because it's in the press, but potentially the the pla the the, the power that the player suddenly has in terms of the player creating the narrative through his agent or whatever as opposed to the club you know it's it, it, at some point and maybe it's where maybe we're only talking the real pinnacle of the game but at some point there is a a shift isn't hmm. there of that, course yeah. yeah definitely there is just going back to that where you're saying about like the relationships you have it's very very hard to trust it's hard to trust anyone in football, though. You know, when you when you say about the relationships, you think as, as I've got older, the, well, probably my biggest strength was the relationships I had with the guys, just because the older I've got, the more brutally honest I've been. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got closer through that, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very. I always think you should let you should let everything that you're feeling outside the club. I always think you should have that. My dad's my go-to person. And you know, one billion percent, it's going nowhere. Whatever I say now is going absolutely nowhere. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I think you can I think you can manipulate a little bit and work well with the coaches. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes that goalie group can seem really, really yeah. strong, but sometimes it's 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 the complete opposite, yeah. you know? Because a goalie coach is in a tough role because he's got two, three other guys, mm. you know. Is it nice for you to feed off of them? Yeah, yeah, it's great. But that trust things, t that's, it's tough. Yeah. I think yeah, that's yeah. a podcast in itself, honestly. Who's who's the Lewis Ward release valve? Who is that? Go and download um, and completely just... My girlfriend, for sure. She's obviously in football. Mm. She, she gets it. She understands football. She understands the trials and when you get left out of a team, she understands. So she knows when to question. She knows when you want to be left alone. Mm. Um, definitely my parents as well. But over the, there was a, we did have a sports psychologist at Reading and I still, still speak to her every now and again. Um, I spoke to her a couple of months ago and it's just 
from a psychological point of view, she's very she's very helpful for me. Um, just to kind of, she plays a bit of both sides, and she she kind of like explains what could be the other side of it because she works in football. She she's seen a lot of it, so she she plays both sides. Kind of gets me to calm down, see it from both points of view, explains it, and then speaks to me how I'm feeling about it. So I've got a few people, um, but definitely girlfriends, definitely one of them because. She understands. I think that's the important bit is sometimes stopping and seeing the other, yeah, seeing that other side, yeah, isn't yeah. it? You know, it, I think that is the, the key is to try and see both sides. But like you say, someone needs to go, just chill out for a minute. Mm. Let's just let's go for dinner, let's go and chill out, let's have a chat about, about it, about calm it. down, yeah. Yeah. you know. And and again, people outside the game don't see that emotional side, no. they just see, oh, brilliant, you train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and play in front of 40,000 people, brilliant. There's so much more to it than that. Yeah. Like, so much more. So, but like you say, it will make you so much stronger. So much stronger for going through them experiences mm. early. Especially the two managers then go and look, we're done. You know, I think psychologically that can help you immensely moving forward. Because mm. I don't think there's much else that you can, there's much more you can, <laughs> absolutely, you can deal with. The next one is, will you take the team because I'm leaving? Yeah, no problem. I've been here before. Right, you go left back, you go right. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. think, it's no problem. You know, so yeah, the experiences. Uh, uh, I love hearing the, the experiences. Mm. They're brilliant because you know, in five years' time, you'll just be like, you'll be one of the strongest members in the team, without a shadow of a doubt, because mm. nothing affects you. So, so you had this awful six months. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's uh, it's green and vegan. Um, <laughs> it is, yeah, very good. And you've yeah. been thinking about that for long. No, yeah, it just popped into my head. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, sure thank you. Um, Forest green. <laughs> 